Can you imagine the, the strength of someone that could lift, let's say, four or five tons? Do you think maybe uh, they could pedal pretty fast or they could paddle, forgive me, paddle pretty fast? And, and again, you know, even if you just, they just uh, uh, assumed normal technology, it would, it would be amazing. Then you get into the Vimana, V-I-M-A-N-A, the, the flying ships of the Mahabharata, the Indian flying ships, and, and you, you even get the, uh, Hannibal. Uh, when you know was basically there are there are records of Hannibal encountering you know flying platforms that battled him you know sending him back so you know the the point is is that are all these guys just stoned out of their mind and drunk I don't think so you know the point is it's a, it's amazing to me that that people don't understand look until the Rosetta Stone was found that was basically a a stone that uh, enabled scholars to read hieroglyphics because it translated between Greek uh, the Dodetic script and hieroglyphics, you know, they had a tough time. And now, I believe the Rosetta Stone, I think that's what my book Genesis Six Giants is, quite candidly, there's no other book like it. There no, simply there is no other book like it. And I want to share with people that I, I guarantee them in the 479 pages, if their minds aren't blowing and they go, wow, that I failed. But if I have, and I'm able to get them to think and to question, why are these things kept from us? I think it will help people to put history into perspective, and by putting history into perspective, they'll be able to see the future. You will get some skeptics who say, nah, you're nuts. Not true. Yep, I know that, and I deal with them all the time, but I say this. Look, I've done my homework, and if you want to argue over the history of these things, let's talk about that. But what skeptics typically do, out of either fear, anger, or jealousy, they go into what in Latin is called the argumentum ad hominem, which basically just means attack the writer, attack the man, but you can't really attack the argument because there's too much data. And we see that continuing all the time, and unfortunately, many incredibly gifted and talented men have been destroyed when they come up with anything that is not status quo. And my motto simply is this, the, his, the status quo of history is an absolute matrix, and 90% of, of, of uh, prehistoric history and ancient history is a lie. What's your take on Zachariah Sitchin, the author of The uh, Twelfth Planet and some other related books? Well, first of all, I've read everything he's written, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I would say this, where Zachariah Sitchin is claiming that the Anunnaki made us, okay, and that uh, Adam was the first test tube child, right. there are guys who are tremendous, tremendous scholars of the Semitic language. I am not one of them, okay? But there are the guys, and they question a lot of his interpretation. Michael S. Heiser, he's a Ph.D. candidate, Department of Hebrew and Semitic Studies, University of Wisconsin, has basically... Uh, I said, Zachariah, a lot of your investigation is true, but a lot of your word derivations are wrong. And I would say this, it's a lot, as it's amazing to me, people don't want to, they want to throw God out, but they're certainly willing to accept the fact that maybe aliens genetically altered us or created us in the laboratory. Then my question to them is, who created the aliens? So if you get to first cause, when I'm saying this first cause, uh, the, uh, quote, absolute uh, 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 creative brilliance and genius of the universe, I'd say, uh, you know, Zachariah Sitchin's got some great stuff, but I also think that, and I can't, I can't uh, agree with him on the Anunnaki. Listen, according to the Sumerian pantheon, the Anunnaki were the seven judges of hell. hell. They were the children of the god Anu, A-N-U, and, 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 and they were contemporary with the seven fates or the Pleiades, and you know it's interesting because in the in the, you see how if it's if it's the seven judges of hell and Zachariah Sitchin says those who came from heaven to earth and and Leel was uh, one of the gods of the Sumerian he was the child of An A in heaven and the and and the son of of earth okay excuse me the 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 mother earth T K I so you see again this heaven and earth coming together to produce the the gods and listen if you were a giant with supernatural intelligence supernatural strength, supernatural wisdom, I think the people who you were ruling over, unless you had to get hungry and ate them all, would pretty much worship you. And well, I think that's, that's the history of a lot of the demigods, especially of Greek and Roman mythology. What I find fascinating, though, with you and with Sitchin and others is, is you all agree about giants, that they were there. It's just the interpretation of what they did and how they did it. Right. That's different. And, and I, for, for the record, uh, George, I don't think where Zachariah has done his excellent work in his areas, 
to my knowledge, the area of Giants has never been as methodically attacked. And obviously, I'm not being super linear and sequential tonight, but I can tell you this. The book is, is the size of a bloody phone book about. And, and, and when I say that, there is so much in it that will absolutely fill in the question marks, you know. I can remember uh, being a student in, in anthropology at, uh, in college and absolutely saying, you mean you guys built this whole Australopithecus off of a jaw? You mean you, you, you built Cro-Magnum, uh, man, out of this? In essence, there's a lot more, if you will, faith and uh, speculation than when you find a complete skeleton. Again, I would encourage people uh, who are on the Internet to go to the website, uh, stevequail.com, they can link to it through artbell.com, and look at the chart. It's absolutely amazing. Then look at the skulls. And when you look at the skulls and you look at the chart, you go, wow, this stuff is in museums and no one's ever said, how do these guys get such big heads? Well, you know, Stephen, you and I have talked before, and uh, and there are many things you've pointed out that I go, "Wow, he's right on." I'm I'm going to jump out of the box for a moment here and agree with you wholeheartedly about the origin of the giants that they were there. I'm not sure I can believe that there's a secret group out there trying to genetically create them again. I hope that's not not my own naivete here well you know again i don't think it's naivete but can i tell you something absolutely we have a hard time and i won't be offended either no no Go no ahead. no. I, I mean our naivete is based on the fact that most of us really and i would say this because of uh, the the blessing of living in america we want to believe the best you know the problem comes when you believe the best and you see that there are people that absolutely do not wish the best for you, but wish ultimate harm. We, we, we've talked about it on previous shows we've done about jihad and the fact of unleashing Ebola and some of these horrible, horrible biological pathogens. Who would do that, George? You wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. But, there but, are some, people but that somebody would do will. It. There are people that will do it. There are people that will do it. So understand this, that when you're talking about... Uh, Genetics. You're not only talking about from 1999 on. You're talking about you know the the boys from Brazil. You're talking about Mengele type stuff, and you're then talking about you know all of the science that was up to it. And then you're talking about what I would call the arcane science. And again, there's so much stuff that is not given to us because again of national security. By the way, I wish they would be honest and call it national insecurity. Okay. <laughs> I believe the American people are a lot brighter, and the people could handle the truth. And my statement is, if they won't give us the truth, that means they want to control us with the lack of truth or with a lie. Do you know what would happen if they built giants that ran amok? What a disaster this could be. Well, let me ask you this. What do you think the psychology will be that if there is real or imagined, if you will, the battle in outer space comes to the battle on Earth? If, if, let's say this, let's say in the next two weeks, let's say instead of one incident, let's say we hear of six to eight incidents, George, where, where there are actually flying saucers opening up with some kind of particle beam blasting people. Funny you bring that up. I just had a story in India of some people who have been blasted by a huge sphere-type object, and they've been burned. You got it. So that's one incident. What happens if it turns to six, eight, or twelve? Then we got a problem. Then we got a problem. Okay. Then we have then we have panic. Yeah. Now remember when Whitley Strieber wrote Communion? Okay. Sure. The neat thing about that is is in Whitley's own words, the the fascinating thing about the aliens and the giants, and I, I mean this, they're both sex fiends. Okay. There are instances. I got to tell you a specific incident in uh, Guayaquil, Ecuador, that was uh, chronicled by Pedro Cieza, and I may be pronouncing his name wrong, De Leon. But he said this. Uh, the Ecuadorian giants were destroyed by thunderbolts in 1543. The teeth found with the giant skulls and bones, they were three fingers broad and four fingers long. He said they were 18 feet tall. He said to, in those days you could actually see on the rocks where the thunderbolts had hit them, okay? The reason why they also record the thunderbolts is that these guys, being 18 feet tall, were uh, sexually going after the women, and I don't mean to be crude, but the bottom line is it killed the women, okay? And the point that I'm trying to make is, is that when you've got such specific chronicles 
and usually, you know, the guys doing the chronicling aren't out there trying to just uh, uh, fit the history to, to fit their uh, chief, or chief uh, belief. You've got incidents where some of these guys' molars make a fist, George. Some of their, their molars was bigger than your fist. That's a big mouth. That's a pretty big tooth to pull if you're a dentist, isn't it? Yeah, and some of these guys had 40-inch feet. How big would someone with a 40-inch foot, you know? Yeah. I, mean, I got news for you. There's no way to uh, even begin to fathom the stride of someone like that until you realize that they can outrun horses. Stephen, a quick question out of Kennewick, Washington, and this guy is dead serious. He says, my daughter has six toes on each foot. What does this mean? Is this uh, some kind of a genetic sign or, you know, well, just, my, just my a flu? My statement is if she doesn't have six fingers, six toes, and double sets of teeth, he doesn't have to worry. But it is interesting. Uh, a little baby that uh, is, belongs to one of my ex-secretaries had six uh, fingers on one toe. Uh, excuse me, six fingers on one hand, but not six fingers on the toes. Unless they have toes, uh, if they had toes and fingers, I'd tell him point blank that she's got, you know, she's got something interesting going on with her. That is, I, that is bizarre, if it you can bizarre. imagine a little uh, girl with that. Right, and, and again, you know, I know this sounds almost, uh, and I don't mean it to sound cynical, but when you talk about guys that had double sets of teeth, I mean, you're talking about, uh, in the Old Testament, talks about the lion men of Moab. And, and, you know, interesting, by the way, he's calling from Kennewick. Did he, did he send you that from Kennewick, Washington? Yes. You know, there's a fight going on over the Kennewick man, which is interesting because in the United States there's a law that anything that is a found of antiquity is automatically assumed to be a Native American. But when they ran the test, the genetic DNA test on Kennewick man, they found out he was pretty much European in about 3,000 years, I think 3,000 to <laughs> 3,500 B.C., okay? Stay with us. Stephen Quayle, my guest. His book, Genesis 6, Giants. I'm George Norrie, and this is Coast to Coast AM. And this is Coast to Coast AM around the world, definitely around the country, as you listen to your favorite radio station. Stephen Quayle, my guest. I'm George Norrie. Stephen, are you afraid at all of the giants in the research you've done, or are you concerned about the future a few years down the line here? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm concerned about the future because, again, I believe that with what's going on, and, and obviously I believe at some point we're going to undergo, whether it's a staged or an implemented or a coerced, uh, you know, uh, battle, if you will, with the uh, guys from, from outer space. I think that we're, we've got to have the knowledge. See, George, I believe with with what I've done in Genesis 6, I, I presented kind of, I guess, the key to unlocking history. And with the sister book that's uh, Aliens and Fallen Angels, The Sexual Corruption of the Human Race, it's taking away the fear factor. It's not adding to it. But I can tell you that what concerns me is, again, that people who uh, seem to be uh, preoccupied with the mundane things of life, when I say the mundane things, just the day-to-day -day grind, when a lot of this stuff starts to happen, we're going to see a lot of people losing losing it. In other words, you know, it's going to flip them out. And I think if they have uh, the knowledge base and they see how all this relates in history, I think it makes you know what could be considered scary and uh, an unnerving subject matter. I think it can make it a lot more palatable. Let's face it: most people in 20th century America or 21st century America now don't have to deal. They think with the Middle Ages and demons and all the stuff that goes along with that. But I'm suggesting that all that stuff's going to come to the forefront. And, and let me share this, too, because I always get yelled at for not giving out my telephone number because a lot of people are on the, uh, you know, Internet, but there are people that are listening that aren't on computer. Well, that's true. My, my, and so you guys don't get all the calls. My, and my number, everyone, is 1-800-424-7870. one 800 424 Seven eight seven zero for those who uh, would like to order the book. And again, George, I think that by having such a and, and this thing is a reference book because I mean the whole half of it is an encyclopedia of this stuff. I think it's put it together in such a way that th there's no scare factor, but it's absolutely fascinating. And like I say, it gives you a groundwork to understand not only prehistoric history. And ancient history, and by the way, my definition of prehistoric is prior to Adam and Eve. And the point being is it explains a lot of the monuments and who built them. Again, if you've got ten guys that are 26 feet tall and they can each carry five tons, 
it makes 50 ton, uh, uh, you know, blocks of stone pretty, um, pretty manageable as, you know, trying to come up with a certain amount of slaves with a certain incline to the ramp and certain ropes. It's just nonsense the way that uh, uh, modern history and ancient history has been presented in modern times. First time caller, you 